All right, go for it, Liam. Cool. All right. Uh, so I guess maybe the first thing I want to do is, uh, I guess I'll probably write Steenrod algebra down because that's what we're talking about. Let's see if I can spell English words today. Uh, and then I guess the next thing I want to do is I want to write down a bunch of references. Um, uh, so like if you're looking for some references, there's a lot of great places. You can kind of look in Mosher Tangora if you want to know about the prime two. Uh, you can look in these great notes uh, that I think are based on like lecture notes of, uh, of uh, Norman Steenrod, but you can look at the Steenrod uh, Epstein notes uh, for uh, P equals two and for odd primes. Um, and then there's also this book of May, uh, which is, I think, just an algebraic approach to steam route operations. And there's a lot of good stuff in here. Um, I think that Hatcher, Hatch, Hatcher has a nice section on these things that's pretty self-contained and complete. And then of course, like Milner's paper, the steam route algebra and its dual, if you're looking for stuff about the dual steam route algebra. Um, so, but today I think, um, and, and I guess maybe there's also this other interesting uh, like little note of Dylan Wilson that I, that I wanna point out, which is called mod two power operations revisited, which is kind of related to all the stuff that we're gonna talk about today, but, but sort of has a different aim. But I think it's like kind of a nice modern perspective on, on these mod two power operations. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, uh, okay, so I guess uh, I wanna start off with like two guiding questions. Um, so that's not how you spell the word two. Um, so let me just start off with like two guiding questions. So the first question is, what is the Steenrod algebra? And then the second question is, what can we do with it? And now, I mean, these are kind of like, you know, the canonical questions you might try to write down if you have to give a talk about something, right? What is the thing actually, and then what is it good for? And this is kind of how I wanna organize um, what I'm gonna talk about today. And let me start off with two unhelpful answers to this question, just to kind of give us a little bit uh, of like a little bit of grounding. So, so the first unhelpful answer is that the dual Steenrod algebra, which I'm gonna, you know, denote using this or not, sorry, not the dual Steenrod algebra, Steenrod algebra, which I'm gonna denote as like script A upper star. This is just the same thing as uh, the, uh, the stable maps of various degrees between the eilenberg maclean spectrum of HFP. So this is perhaps an answer, but an unhelpful one um, because the thing on the right hand side, like at least a priori, it's not clear like what this looks like at all. I mean, we can probably say what it looks like in degree zero pretty easily, but like if you want to describe the whole structure, it's it's not totally clear like what this thing is. And so in some sense, this is an unhelpful answer to this question, but it's an answer nonetheless. Um, and then the second, oh, what the hell? <laughs> Sorry, my, uh, my pencil is being very odd today. Uh, and so the second answer I want to give that's also sort of unhelpful, is that like, there's a lot of things, like a lot, a lot of things. And so just to kind of like say a few of these uh, as like a little bit of a roadmap forward into some of what we'll talk about, I think next week and beyond. Um, so it's the base over which we uh, work. It's like the base over which we take X in the classical atom spectral sequence. So something called like CLASS, so we're going to be talking, I think Zach is going to be talking about this next week. And so the algebra of the Steenrod algebra features really heavily into making calculations in the E2 page of the spectral sequence, which converges to uh, the two completed stable homotopy groups of spheres. Uh, and so that's one reason why it's important. Um, so another reason is that it can help us detect differences in structure. 
uh, and it helps us exclude structure. Um, so this is kind of of the same, this is of the same flavor of like all, like anytime we have an algebraic invariant of a space or a spectrum, we want to know when two things are the same, like we can calculate vary in various invariants and if they're different than they, then the objects themselves have to be different in some suitable homotopical way. Um, uh, so there's uh, the Hopf invariant one problem. Um, which I'm probably not going to say anything about. You can show that a couple of the first like stable stems are non-trivial using the Steenrod squares. Um, and then like just for my own uh, personal taste, um, the structure of the, of the dual Steenrod algebra actually features into a calculation of, of some invariant called topological Hochschild homology of, of, uh, of, of uh, FP and you, crucially use like the dual Steenrod algebra and the way various things act on this to, to calculate this object. And so there's a lot of things we can do with this. Um, and, and what I wanna try to do today is I really wanna try to give slightly better answers to these two questions. So like for question one, I wanna spend some time actually talking about the structure of this algebra. And then for question two, uh, at the end, I kind of wanna give an example, like a really nice example, I think of where we can basically exclude structure um, uh, from an object. Essentially, I'm going to show that a spectrum does not admit a, uh, a multiplication, uh, essentially by doing some calculations with the Steenrod algebra and, and cohomology. Um, okay, so that's my goal for the day. Um, okay, so let's start off with what I'm going to call section one, I guess. So section one. Um, I don't know, everything I've said is pretty vague, so um, there, there's probably not any Maybe there's not any questions, but I guess I just want to stop and see if there are before I actually like move into section one um, or any comments people feel like they want to add. And, and please feel free to jump in and interrupt me at any time. Um, okay, cool. So let's talk about the structure. So the structure of, uh, of the Steenrod algebra. Okay, so based on the way we've defined this thing, there's a couple of things that we can tell essentially right away. So first of all, um, like some, I guess maybe I'll call this some basic structure. Uh, so, so one thing is that because we've essentially defined this as, uh, as maps from HFP to HFP, this admits a, a, a multiplication, essentially just given by function composition. Um, and there's already an addition on the on this uh, this set of this this group of maps as well. And so basically composition gives a multiplication. Uh, and notably a non-commutative multiplication. Um, so we have to be careful about this because you know we can't always compose two things in, in a row and get the same thing. Um, composition is very non-commutative. Uh, so that's like one thing. So in fact, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an FP algebra, even an FP algebra. Um, so the other thing is that uh, we know that, so if we think about what the cohomology of, of, a, of a spectrum is. So if X is a spectrum, then the cohomology of, of X with, with mod P coefficients can be expressed as uh, exactly, exactly this. And so there's an action of the Steenrod algebra on the cohomology uh, of any spectrum, essentially just given by composition. And so this tells us that, that the, the mod P cohomology of any spectrum or space, if you want to take the suspension spectrum first, admits the, uh, admits the structure of, of a module over the Steenrod algebra. And, and in particular, this is like kind of, uh, uh, this is kind of additional structure because not only, you know, if, so, so the reason we can use this to like exclude structure is essentially that if I have two spectra now and I want to know whether they're like equivalent as spectra, 
If they are, then this module structure uh, with respect to the Steenrod algebra is going to have to be equivalent for both of these things. And so even if two objects have like, uh, you know, maybe isomorphic cohomology groups, right, we still need to, we can still distinguish these spectra by looking at the action of the Steenrod algebra on cohomology. Um, and so this is exactly the way, and fortunately, as we'll kind of see in a little bit, the structure of the Steenrod algebra like makes it very amenable to like making calculations of this form. Um, and so this is one way you would kind of delineate between two spectra um, if you sort of knew about the action of the Steenrod algebra on their, on their cohomology groups. Um, okay, so let me now, so this is kind of the basic structure. So here's, uh, so here's more refined structure. And um, I'm just gonna state this in the form of a theorem. Uh, the theorem is basically that uh, as, as an algebra, uh, the Steenrod algebra is, um, is generated uh, by uh, certain uh, cohomology operations uh, called square n. And so I should also say this is for p equals two, um, which basically go from, which shift the degree up by n. And here, uh, all the cohomology groups that I have here are with, uh, with uh, mod two coefficients. Um, so they're generated by these certain cohomology operations, square n's, and these square n's satisfy a bunch of different conditions. And I'm going to write the condition, I'm going to write uh, some of the conditions, or I guess I'm going to write the conditions down. I might not write the ADEM relations out, uh, but maybe I will for, uh, I haven't quite decided yet, just depending on how much space we have. So, so the first thing is that uh, square zero is the identity. The second thing is that uh, when X is a cohomology class in degree N, uh, square N of X is just X squared. So in some sense, these square Ns are generalizations of this operation of, of, of taking the cup product of a cohomology class with itself. Um, the next thing is that uh, when, uh, when the degree of X uh, is equal to m, and let's say this is less than n, then the Steenrod, uh, the Steenrod squares act in a really nice way. In particular, they act by zero on, uh, on such things. And so basically, like, uh, we know that the Steenrod squares act by zero on a lot of different cohomology classes. Um, so the fourth thing is that there's a, there's a compatibility with the, with the cup product. So if we cup any two classes together, we can write this as a sum of, uh, of, uh, of products of lower degree squares. Um, and, uh, and so this is, this is like an internal compatibility with the cut product. There's also like an external compatibility with the product. Like if you had a class in the, uh, in, in the cohomology uh, of X and the cohomology of Y, um, you can uh, take their like Basically, by Kunith, you can use those to produce a class on x cross y, and uh, there's a prod, there's an external product associated with that procedure, and, and the square ends are compatible with this as well. Um, so the fifth thing I want to write down is that square one is actually a really familiar, um, a really familiar operation, uh, which I'm going to call beta, which is the Bockstein. Uh, and this is uh, the thing that basically comes from the following uh, sequence of groups, right? So we have this short exact sequence here. And uh, this short exact sequence is gonna induce a long exact sequence uh, of various cohomology groups. And there's gonna be a boundary operator in this long exact sequence that's gonna increase the degree by one. And the boundary operator that we get from this short exact sequence is precisely this box stein, this square one. So square one is exactly that. Uh, and then, the last thing uh, are the sort of uh, maybe, I don't know, loathe to me at least, uh, ADEM relations, uh, mostly because I never remember them. Um, so the ADEM relations. Uh, 
Okay, and this looks like the following. So if I have a less than two b uh, bigger than zero, then I can write this composition of squares as a sum of other compositions of squares. So this is like the floor of a divided by two. I'm gonna have some uh, binomial expression here. And then this is gonna be square a plus b minus i uh, is square i. And so essentially this kind of allows us to rewrite, um, this allows us to rewrite uh, compositions of, of Steenrod squares as a, as a sum of comp other compositions of Steenrod squares. Okay, and so this is all for um, this is all for p equals two, uh, and I should just mention for so for for p odd right, for p bigger than two, uh, analogous statements uh, hold, but uh, instead of instead of like square n, we have these things called the Steenrod powers p n um, and Instead, and uh, we additionally have like the Bockstein is kind of added as its own thing. Like now our square one is this Bockstein uh, and a lot of the different relate, uh, most of the relations are kind of uh, the same except uh, certain like square or like our squaring property is no longer like squaring. It's raising something to like a pth power. And there are some issues with like needing classes to be sort of in even degrees. Um, and uh, like the ADEM relations now don't just involve uh, compositions of these Steenrod powers, but they also involve compositions with the Bockstein as well. Um, and so there are analogous statements that I'm not going to spend a bunch of time writing down uh, because it already took a long time to write these things down. Uh, and it turns out that um, uh, these properties, so maybe this is a remark. So these properties, oh, and, and I guess there's something that I haven't said uh, that I should say. And I should say that all of these cohomology operations, which are essentially just natural transformations between uh, various, co like various cohomology groups, um, all of these things are stable in the sense that they commute with the suspension isomorphism. And this is, this is important um, because, you know, otherwise, they're not going to be compatible with much of the stuff we, we want them to be compatible with. Um, and so these properties, uh, so I don't know the exact precise statement, but the point is that these properties uh, uniquely characterize the squares, um, I guess, Bockstein and powers among stable cohomology operations. Okay, and so the point is that A as an algebra is generated by all of these cohomology operations. Um, and this is kind of like the big structure theorem uh, for the Steenrod algebra. Um, okay, so there are kind of like two complaints which are extremely reasonable to kind of bring up right now. So one of those complaints is the following. So where do these things actually come from, right? I've like said that these properties uniquely characterize these squares. Um, however, like we still need to build them in some way. And the other reasonable complaint that one could make is that why the hell is the algebra generated by these things actually the same as like stable maps from HFP to HFP? Like, there are some things that need to be explained, uh, and I will do my best to explain some of these things. Um, so I guess like two complaints. So where do these come from? And I guess the second complaint is why is uh, the big thing above the same thing as this. So these are two very reasonable complaints. Um, okay, and so what I want to do 
is I want to try to say something about number two. And maybe if there's time at the end, I'll come back and try to say something about number one as well, because uh, both of these are interesting um, and like worth a lot of discussion. But unfortunately, like proving these things requires like some pretty like intricate calculations and you have to be really careful. And people spent a lot of time thinking about this uh, in the 50s, 60s and, and 70s. So I guess maybe, uh, again, I haven't really said anything. I, I've just told you a theorem. So maybe there's like no questions at this point, but uh, I do just wanna pause to see if there are questions or other complaints or, or commentary that people want to add. Um, so it might be worth mentioning that um, although the Steenrod operations act on cohomology of spectra, some of these properties only sort of make sense for cohomology of spaces. Um, so it, right. uh, properties two through four, I think, use the cup product in some essential way. And this is, a, this is something about the cohomology of spaces that doesn't really make sense for spectra. Yeah, OK. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Right, so maybe I should, oh, sorry, go ahead. I mean, it's a silly one. Is there a way to remember the ADEM relations and should one try? I'm the wrong person to ask that question of. <laughs> no. <laughs> you should not try to remember the ADEM relations. There is an algorithm yeah. for sort of easily producing them as you need them inductively. Define it easily. Or, or tell me the algorithm some other time. I, okay, I, I, yeah, uh, no problem. Yeah, I just want to add a note here that uh, to to what Paul to what Paul said is that like really these properties characterize these things as like stable cohomology operations of the cohomology of spaces. So. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. It's like one of those type error things that uh, one could make, or sometimes one makes, or at least I make. Uh, okay, <clears throat> cool. So I guess I'm going to do the sort of normal thing and I'm more or less only going to talk about like in, in like the proofs and the careful things that I work out today, I'm really only gonna talk about P equals two just because it's kind of annoying to systematically remember to write the box stein in and like shifting of degrees is more irritating. Um, so I'm just gonna work with P equals two for today. And like all, all of the, you know, there's a lot of statements that you might need to go look in other references to sort of find the correct analogs for like odd primes. Um, but uh, let's just kind of like take a look at an example, to sort of see how this stuff works. Um, because I personally like, this definition of, uh, of the Steenrod algebra as stable maps from HFP to HFP was probably the first definition I saw of the Steenrod algebra, but it doesn't really give you a flavor of like how this stuff actually works. Um, and so let's like look at an example. So here's an example. So here's a question. How does, or I guess how do, the square ends act on, uh, I don't know, the cohomology of something that we understand pretty well, um, the mod two cohomology of, uh, of real projective space, which, which is a, a polynomial ring uh, on a generator in degree one. Um, okay, so this is a question we can ask. And there's actually like a really nice general answer um, for, for how this works. So maybe I'm going to like answer this question um, in like kind of a more abstract way. So in general, so if I have a space uh, X and I know that the, that the cohomology of X is the same thing as, as a polynomial algebra on a generator U in degree one, then I can always calculate what's, uh, you know, maybe mm, I can always calculate the, the action of, uh, of the squares on this polynomial generator. Um, so can calculate uh, what square n looks like on u. Um, so, okay, so how, how would we go about like trying to figure this sort of thing out? 
Well, let's just start with like the zeroth thing, right? So square zero, uh, we know that this is just the identity. And so like square zero of u uh, is just going to be, um, uh, this is just going to be u. And maybe I should also say that um, really what I should be doing is not just calculating the uh, what's, what's going on, on on square n of u, but square n of u to the k. Maybe. Um, OK, so this tells me what happens on u. And so this tells me what happens on like u to the k. So it just does nothing, which is really nice. And so what we what's actually true is that it turns out that um, uh, I'm just going to change my notation slightly uh, just to match my notes. Um, but he, the claim the claim is basically that um, a square i of uh, of u to the k is going to be equal to uh, k choose i times u to the k plus i. Um, and how does this go? Well, I mean, we literally just did the inductant the induction step. And so we can just like assume the result holds uh, for for let's say you know uh, so assume holds for k minus one. Well, what can we do? We can break this up. We can say well square i. Uh, we have square i of u to the k minus one times u, and then we can essentially just use our uh, the fact that the, the squares are compatible with cup products to rewrite everything. Um, so this is going to look like square, uh, let's see, square, uh, I don't know, i minus j times u to the k minus 1 times square j uh, times u. But um, we can then use like the other property, which is that since the degree of, of u is 1, um, these square j's on the class u uh, are going to be trivial, like basically all the time, uh, except for uh, square zero and square one. And so if we just sort of uh, write this out, what we end up getting is we just end up getting uh, square uh, i minus one of u to the, uh, to the k minus one times square one of u uh, plus uh, square zero of u times uh, square uh, i of u to the k minus 1. Uh, and so what we can do at this point um, is we can uh, rewrite these. Um, so for this here, right, since the degree of, uh, since the degree of u is 1, square 1 of that is just going to be uh, u squared. Uh, and then we can uh, use the inductive hypothesis on this term. Uh, and on on this term as well, um, and so what we're going to get is we're going to get uh, k minus one. Oh, I'm in red here. Sorry. This is going to be equal to uh, k minus one to k minus one choose i minus one times u to the k plus i minus two times u squared plus um, u times k minus one choose i times u to the k plus i. And then we basically just use Pascal's formula for, or Pascal's relation or whatever you want to call it for binomial coefficients to, uh, to combine these things. And we just get k choose i times u to the k plus i. Um, and so this tells us exactly uh, what the squares are going to be doing to the various powers of the degree one generator uh, in the cohomology of, uh, of RP infinity. Um, and basically, if you like are careful about everything mod two, what turns out to happen is that um, square i on the uh, the even powers of u, so two to the k, this is going to be equal to uh, u to the two to the k when i is zero, uh, u to the two to the k plus one when uh, i is two to the k and then zero otherwise. So this is just kind of like a nice example of how the squares are going to behave uh, on, on, these, on these various powers of these polynomial, uh, of the polynomial generator. Um, and so this kind of gives us like a little bit of a flavor 
uh, for what is like what these squares are doing, what these steam rod squares are doing. Um, and an interesting consequence of this fact is that um, because of the way the squares are acting on this polynomial generator, this, uh, this actually shows that um, essentially using like the suspension isomorphism and compatibility uh, of the squares with the suspension isomorphism that uh, no suspension of RP infinity uh, splits, uh, uh, no suspension of RP infinity like splits as a wedge of spaces. Uh, basically because the action of the Steenrod algebra kind of like ties all these powers together. Um, so that's kind of an interesting consequence of this, of, of like this exact calculation. Um, okay. Any questions so far about like the, the computation I just did or like any of the things I've said? Um, hopefully this is all tangible enough for, for people's taste. <clears throat> but not too basic. I don't know. just wanted to say, or maybe I shouldn't say, but there's, if you look at the sum of all Steenrod squares together, the Carton formula says that's a ring map and that can really help the last uh, deduction. Um, you get, um, right. I don't know. I don't know if you probably did it this way for a specific way, but it's a sort of satisfying uh, sanity trick. Ah, for the for the claim about the stable splitting or the the, the lack of stable splitting. Oh no no no, just the just the formula itself. Um, ah ah ah. Okay okay. Oh yes yeah. Right yeah. I kind of I just kind of did this one because, uh, well one this was like literally the argument uh, the literally the argument that I that I knew um, and uh, and I think yeah but but yeah maybe we could talk about that uh, in after. after yeah sorry. Quarter or something. No no it's okay it's okay. I I'd love to see about that because I'm not super familiar with like a lot of this classical stuff. Um, okay, cool. So maybe that's like, you know, one relatively like satisfying, uh, uh, relatively satisfying like example of, of how this stuff goes. Um, uh, and so there's kind of a pointed reason that I, that I chose this, this example. Um, and, and basically the reason is as follows. Um, it turns out that, uh, the, the, the Steenrod algebra um, has a basis that is like, uh, has a basis of like specific types of composites of these squares. Um, and, and in particular, they're, they're called admissible sequences. Uh, and I want to say something about how one sees that uh, you can generate the Steenrod algebra via these admissible sequences. Um, so maybe I should say what, what it means to be admissible. So here's the definition. Uh, so a monomial of the form, so I'm gonna call this uh, square i, and i is going to be a sequence. Um, so square i is gonna be uh, square i sub one, square i sub two, dot, 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 square, uh, I guess, i sub k. So this is admissible. And so I guess I here is the sequence I1 da, 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 up to IK. And we just call this, um, so, so I is an admissible sequence. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm not properly structuring my, my sentence here. So a monomial of this form is called admissible. Uh, if the sequence I satisfies uh, the following uh, condition, we just have that I uh, R minus one is bigger than or equal to two times I sub R. Um, so as, uh, so basically as we sort of go from the inside to the outside of the squares, the powers uh, get bigger. Um, uh, okay. And so it turns out that we have the following theorem or maybe proposition. Uh, I think, I don't know if these references are perfectly correct, but I think this is, I saw this attributed to Sayre if P equals two and um, to Adem Carton uh, if P is not two. Um, 
but I don't know, these things are like so embedded in the literature at this point that, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't know where, how to backtrack and find the, the precise references, but maybe somebody knows. So, but, but the point is basically as a module uh, over um, F2, uh, the admissible monomials form a basis. for the Steenrod algebra. Okay, um, so I don't want to go super into the details of this proof, but I do want to like give some idea about how this works uh, because I would feel bad if I didn't do anything. Um, so, so proof idea. So basically, I mean, there's like two claims to handle, right? Like when, whenever we wanna check something's a basis, we always need to check that we can generate everything and we, did, we need to check linear independence. So the generation, uh, so, the, I, so the, we have to generate everything. So the idea essentially behind um, the generation is to essentially start with any monomial. So we start with like any monomial square I. Um, and we wanna show that this can be rewritten as a sum of admissibles. And so we define something called the moment uh, or the like center of mass maybe of the monomial, which is just, you know, what you'd kind of expect. You take the sum of all the like powers of the sort of indices and you multiply by the degree that they're in. Uh, so you take, this is like the moment uh, or like center of mass. And then what you want to do is you want to uh, induct on the size of the moment. And, and essentially what, what one happens, what one does is that you sort of, you start with one of these monomials and then because you have the ADEM relations, you can rewrite the monomials as like, a sum of other compositions. And then you kind of have to handle these sums sort of differently and use the inductive hypothesis um, in, uh, you know, in, in some fashion when, when you do this sort of thing. But, but that's kind of how you get the generation. And the idea is you can sort of systematically um, rewrite uh, all of these monomials via the ADEM relations. You just have to play around with that. And it, uh, it, it, it's sort of, I don't know, like it's kind of obnoxious. Um, in my opinion, but maybe maybe people disagree. Um, and and you have it's sort of fussy to to do this bit. Um, and so the the linear independence is kind of the second step. And and the way that we handle the linear independence um, is what we do is we we construct a map from the the Steenrod algebra into um, the the cohomology of the uh, of the n fold smash product uh, of RP infinity, uh, where this is given by evaluating on um, uh, the class U times n, where U is the generator uh, of the degree one generator uh, of the cohomology ring of R of of, of RP infinity. And then we can essentially identify this with the class in there by Kunith. Um, and so you evaluate on this thing. And what you can essentially do is you can use the exact description uh, of the action of the squares um, on uh, powers uh, of the generator uh, of the cohomology ring to sort of take a, uh, a linearly dependent, like a, a linear dependence in the Steenrod algebra push it through to this cohomology ring and then show that all the coefficients of the relation that you have in this, uh, this other cohomology ring uh, have to be zero. And so this gives you the linear independence uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the admissible monomials uh, in the Steenrod algebra. And so this is kind of like roughly how this goes. Um, I think that you know, this appears in sort of all of the resources that I, uh, or many of the sources that I sort of mentioned earlier, but in particular, uh, there's a nice proof of this in uh, in Barnes-Roitzheim. Um, that's kind of typeset in a way that doesn't look like it was 
uh, off of a typewriter in the 60s, which is like always appreciated. Um, but yeah, so that's sort of the idea of the proof there. Uh, and there's a reason why I wanted to talk about this thing, uh, this, this result uh, specifically. Um, so why care about this, this generating set? Okay, so in addition to this mass or moment that we've talked about, there's something else that we can introduce. We can introduce something called the excess of a sequence. So, uh, so like if I've got uh, some monomial square i, I can just define the excess of i. Essentially, it's the quantity that kind of measures like how far away from like being minimally admissible are we? And the excess is just, uh, maybe I'll just write this down here. The excess of i is uh, the sum um, uh, over j of like ij minus 2ij plus 1. Um, so basically the larger this is, then like the, the monomial we have is like overly admissible as opposed to like minimally admissible. Um, so there's this quantity, it's called the excess. And um, we have the following theorem. So I actually don't know who to attribute this to. So if someone knows, please just tell me. Uh, but it turns out that the, uh, the I'm going to state this not for, uh, I, I guess I'm going to state this um, for P, not necessarily two. So please use the, rel <laughs> please, please keep that in mind um, because I haven't told you, you know, what the sequence is supposed to look like when P is not two. Um, so just use your imagination. So the point is that the, the cohomology of the, uh, the nth uh, eilenberg maclean space of, uh, of Z mod P um, is a free algebra on uh, generators, um, call these maybe, uh, I don't know, phi of I n, um, where you know i n is the cohomology class coming from the identity map from the nth uh, mod p eisenberg maclean space to itself. Oh, sorry, there's questions in the chat or there's, oh, okay, uh, cool. Ah, this is due to Carton as well. Great, thank you, so Carton. Uh, so this is like the, the this is the, the generator corresponding to the identity map. Um, and uh, I can never remember the name for this thing. Uh, and, and where phi n uh, is um, uh, an admissible monomial of excess less than or equal to n. So the idea is essentially that for the nth eilenberg maclean space, we're free on these generators um, provided the excess is like bounded above by n. Um, and so I'm not going to, uh, ah yeah, fundamental class, that's the word. Um, and so I'm not going to prove this, but this calculation is essentially the reason that we're allowed to identify um, the Steenrod algebra as described in that sort of abstract, hey, here's a bunch of stable cohomology operations uh, that satisfy these relations with the definition that we wrote down at the very beginning, which was um, uh, uh, map, like stable maps from HFP to HFP. Um, so in particular, uh, Sorry, can I interrupt for a second? A second. Yes, yeah. I, I think this is not quite right. I think that you need to have um, like an instability relation too. Uh, so for example, the, the RP infinity calculation that you just did, um, square one of the fundamental class is the fundamental class squared. And that's so, um, so that's like square one is an admissible mon monomial of excess one. Uh, and, um, but you need some relation that says that, that, that does the thing that you expect it to do. No, that, 
Th does what I'm saying make sense? Like it's not it's not an additional algebra generator. Right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, so I'll put an asterisk next to this. I think something like free unst. I'm not. Sorry, I'm not sure what the correct statement is, but it's it's close to this. Um, okay. Yeah. I I think I I may have transcribed this uh, imprecisely um, from one of the papers I was looking at. So uh, I can try to I can try to figure out and then post in the chat later, like what exactly is wrong. So this might be wrong. Okay, but but like, okay, so then I guess I guess the point is, there's uh, this sort of this idea that um, if you're sort of just taking these, uh, if you're just taking these, um, uh, if you're essentially just applying all of these uh, admissible monomials of excess less than n to sort of the, the fundamental class, uh, then you can produce a map from uh, basically the Steenrod algebra to, um, uh, to a limit over all of these different cohomology groups. Um, uh, and the point is essentially that, uh, so like using, um, so like using, uh, maybe I should say the sort of adjoint maps that look like this. And then some combination of uh, Freudenthal and Hurevich. Oh God, I never, uh, uh, this shows that uh, the Steenrod algebra is isomorphic to an inverse limit uh, over all of these, um, these cohomologies. And if you kind of unwind exactly what the, the, the algebra of stable maps is, um, the, uh, Ah, okay. You just need excess less than n rather than excess less than or equal to n. Okay. Yeah. And so essentially the the idea is that you can sort of compare the Steenrod algebra, which is the thing that is like uh, generated by all of these admissible monomials of like any excess, right? This is going to be the same thing as the inverse limit over all of these uh, algebras. Um, that are generated by uh, the the monomials evaluated on the fundamental uh, the fundamental class, which have excess less than n. And it, it's also worth mentioning, I think, that you need to do a little bit of checking of compatibility. Essentially, I believe saying that the nth the nth fundamental class gets mapped to the n plus first fundamental class, um, but that's okay. Um, so essentially the idea, the, the point is that, yeah, we can actually honestly identify these things um, as algebras. Uh, but, you know, this is kind of some non-trivial work that needs to be done. Uh, okay, so yeah, I guess I wanna pause now and see if there are like uh, any, any questions about this claim or this statement that I'm making here? Uh, I'm not being super precise, so. Oh yeah, and, and that's a good point. There are, yeah, there are some similar statements for, uh, for P powers um, as well. Not, not just the, the mod P, like these were cut, like the P power eilenberg mclean spaces uh, had their cohomology calculated as well. Uh, but I sort of just selectively picked the, the ones that I sort of needed uh, in, in this specific case. Okay. So, all right. So I think that that's more or less all I kind of wanted to say about the structure of the Steenrod algebra. Uh, obviously, there's like a whole like bunch of the story that I have not really talked about, uh, namely like okay, this thing is a Hopf algebra. It has a co-multiplication. How does the co-multiplication work? What's the dual of this Hopf algebra? And can we identify that structure? 
And uh, there's a great paper due to Milner that everybody should probably go read um, that handles exactly this question. It's, it's really nice. Um, but yeah, we know what the dual steam rod algebra is, which is, which is good. Um, and so I, I don't really want to say anything about that. And maybe that can be something for later talks. Um, because I want to do like one example that I think is really interesting. Um, and I guess there's another, uh, another thing I didn't really talk about is how do we actually construct these square squaring operations, um, which is, you know, a, a good question that one should, one should answer um, if one wants to be honest, but, but I'm, I'm a liar, so I will not. Um, so section two, so maybe I want to give a, a nice example, or I think it's a nice example. of how to use this. Um, and I think this is probably one of those examples that like, you know, most people, I think this is probably a, maybe a familiar example, but, but, but I don't know. So, so the idea is, a, so, so here's, here's just like recall really quickly. Uh, so uh, S mod two, which is the mod two more spectrum, which is just the cofiber uh, in the category of, of spectra uh, of the multiplication by two map on the sphere. So um, I think maybe for brevity, I'm going to call this M uh, just to save me a little bit of uh, a little bit of pain. Um, but so this is the mod two more spectrum. Uh, and the claim that I want to that I want to prove is that so so here's this proposition. Uh, M does not admit a unital multiplication. Okay, so maybe a question is like, why would I expect this thing to admit any kind of unital multiplication in the first place? Um, and I think the naive answer I have to give to that is like, well, you're kind of doing something like fairly, like fairly mild to the sphere spectrum. You're just taking like a cofiber. And so maybe there's a way to kind of like transport the multiplication on the sphere as like the unit to the cofiber of some map. Uh, you know, hindsight is 2020, and in retrospect, one knows that asking for this kind of thing is like in general like a pretty complicated thing. And but but you know maybe if we wanted if we were thinking very naively like this is something that's possibly reasonable. Um, but let's show why it doesn't. Um, and we're literally just going to use the structure of like the Steenrod algebra in this case. So let's give a proof. So, okay, we're going to just go by contradiction. So let's assume it does admit a unital multiplication. So that means there's a map from M smash M. Uh, and I apologize if I write a, a tensor for the smash product, um, just fair warning. Uh, so we do have this and it's got, and it's like left and right unital. Um, which means that if I like precompose by the map from the sphere to the, uh, like if I precompose by like either of these maps, like, so like ID uh, smashed with sort of the, maybe I'll just call it eta. This is probably bad. Maybe I'll call it uh, epsilon. If I like precompose with either of these maps, um, uh, then I get the identity. So that's what it means to have like a unital multiplication. Um, and okay, so why can't this happen? So let's take the cofiber sequence that goes from the sphere to itself to M. So this is multiplication by two. This is that map epsilon. And let's smash this whole cofiber sequence with M. And so we're gonna get another cofiber sequence out of this. And what are we gonna get? Well, we're gonna get S uh, smash M to S smash M, so this is uh, two identity, this is epsilon smash the identity, and this is M smash, or whoops, trying to be trying to be good and not write O times. Um, and then we have, um, and then we have a map out to here, which is a suspension of a S smash with M. Okay. And so the claim is basically that if we had uh, a unital multiplication M, that would split this map uh, from the sphere smashed with M to M smashed with itself. And so in particular, 
we could just take a look at this cofiber sequence here. And since we have something that's split, this, this whole cofiber, since this map splits, this whole cofiber sequence splits, which means that we, could, we would have an equivalence uh, M smash M with uh, M um, maybe wedge a suspension of M. And so that would imply that this is an equivalence of spectra. And so um, as I sort of said at the very beginning uh, of the talk, one of the properties of, of having an equivalence of two spectra is that the Steenrod algebra has to act on the mod P, or in this case, mod two, cohomology of these spectra in an identical fashion in order for these things to be equivalent. Um, and so in particular, this tells us that if this were an equivalence, uh, then we would know that their cohomology as modules over the Steenrod algebra are isomorphic. Um, so let's see, uh, just out of curiosity about what time did we start at um, today? Or should I wrap up in the next like couple minutes? I don't um, yeah, I guess so. I, th I think we started about at about five. Uh, uh, sorry, about six uh, on the hour. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. So, so maybe I'll just like wrap this up really quick then. Um, so, uh, essentially, uh, however, uh, we can calculate their cohomology really explicitly. Their mod two cohomology. So, we can calculate uh, m wedge with the suspension of m. Uh, essentially, just by well, it's a it's a it's a sum of spectra, and so we can just it therefore just suffices to calculate the mod two cohomology of the Mohr spectrum, uh, and what we actually get for the Mohr spectrum is we get something with a generator. Uh, it's got an f two in degree zero and an f two in degree one. So if I wanted to draw that, it would look something like this: so zero, one, two. So what the heck? My Apple Pencil is doing something very odd. I guess it doesn't think I'm picking up uh, my, pen, my the point. So we've got something in degree zero and something in degree one. And then the suspension of M has something in degree one and something in degree two. And it turns out, and you can calculate this essentially just by like unwinding what the Bockstein does on the, on the, various, uh, on the various mod two and mod four cohomologies of the Mohr spectrum. The only the action is entirely given by uh, square one takes the generator in degree zero and sends it to something in degree one, and then square one here sends something in degree one to the thing in degree two, uh, and then on the other hand, uh, if you wrote down what the what this looks like as a uh, uh, I guess this is so this is a wedge and this is a smash here. So if you essentially use uh, the Kuna theorem, you can show that again, as an F2 module, this has um, uh, two generators in degree one, a generator in degree zero, and a generator in degree two. Uh, but the action is given as follows. So we've got square one still hitting the thing over here. We've got a square two now hitting this thing in degree, taking something in degree zero and sending it to degree two. And then we've got this square one over here. And so the point is that uh, the Steenrod squares act differently on the mod two cohomology of these two different spectra. And so they can't be equivalent um, because uh, like, I mean, we've just explicitly calculated this. And so in particular, this says that there's no unital multiplication on the mod two Mohr spectrum. And so this is kind of an example of using the fact that the cohomology of, of your object doesn't isn't just sort of an abstract F two vector space, but it 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 uh it uh it records uh it, it records all the actions of these like squaring operations as well, uh, and, and that's a lot of data, and that's great because that can allow us to say when something doesn't have some property, and this is kind of like a baby example of uh like something that you kind of might do in say if you were doing something in obstruction theory. So I guess I just want to end uh, end everything here. 
Um, and uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for your time, everybody. I appreciate it. Hopefully this was interesting. Thanks, Liam. <laughs>